so we have some some homework. Um, so it's chapter two, chapter on Lagrangian field theory. So problems two point two and two point three. So this one is classical problem, it's a problem in classical Lagrangian field theory, and this is a quantum problem, um, and we'll be looking at the background for that uh, today. So, um, let's see, so this is all right, okay. Alright, so let me start by making a list of everything that you really need to know um, uh, from chapter 2. So you need to know how to get classical field equations from a Lagrangian density using the Euler-Lagrange equation, so you should have done that uh, last week. Um, so the classical Lagrangian field theory for the purposes of this course is, is a tool that we're going to apply. Um, you would have gone through the derivation of some of the equations, but the main thing for our purposes is how to use it. Um, how to get the canonical momentum density. and the Hamiltonian density Oops. and the Hamiltonian density H the Hamiltonian H from, so given the Lagrangian density, you can find the canonical momentum density and the Hamiltonian density. And then number three, so you should have done this already. Um, number three, what we're going to do today is how to promote Fields, so you've got a set of fields with an index R and the canonical momentum density is pi R. How to promote these quantities to field operators? To field operators satisfying. canonical commutation relations or what are often called in this context equal time equal time commutation relations Then, the important thing, I'm uh, listing all the things that you need to get out of this chapter in order to be able to understand what's coming afterwards. Um, number four, um, how to get the So how to evaluate 
to okay how to derive the the field equations for the field operators. the Heisenberg equations of motion <coughs> so these fields when quantized will obey the same field equations as the classical field equations but how can you achieve you should be able to check that and show that you can derive the field equations for these operators from the Heisenberg equations of motion C exercise 2.2. So that's actually the homework problem that I've set you there, 2.2, is to actually do this <coughs> for the Klein Gordon field. And then number five, <coughs> something you need to know about conserved quantities. from Nerda's theorem. Now you will have been through the derivation of some of that last week. Again, for our purposes, what's more important is the theorem that the symmetry of the Lagrangian gives you um, a local conserved quantity, we'll look at more examples. Again, it's something you need it's more important that you know about it rather than you know all about the exactly how it's derived, though obviously it's good if you've gone over that. Um, so alright, so this is what we need to know. Now you should have already done number one, you should have already done number two, and you should have done I think most of number five, and we're going to focus on three and four. So, <clears throat> let's see. <clears throat> so, one begins with a Lagrangian density. Now, so this is a function of phi and of its time and space. Now we could write more generally a set of fields. So the Lagrangian is a function of all of these fields and of their space and time derivatives. It gets a bit messy writing this index R. I'm just going to write one field just to keep, keep the notation simple, so you understand that I can derive, write down a Lagra the Lagrangian is just equal to the integral uh, of the Lagrangian density over space. And the, remember that the, field, the fields and their derivatives are functions of position and of time. So if I integrate over space, this thing is a function of t only. Okay, you should understand that the Lagrangian, if, I'm, if I've given you a field as a function of position and time, I put them in here, this is a becomes a function of position and time. I integrate over space, I'm left with just a function of time. And then the action s is an integral from some initial to some final time um, of the Lagrangian with respect to time, just as in what you're used to in classical mechanics, integrate the Lagrangian over time, that's the action, 
And then the variational principle variational principle that if the fields are changed by some small amount as functions of position and time, then we want the action to be stationary and this implies the Euler-Lagrange equation. equations and write like this So first of all, you may have done, if you went through this last week, you may have looked at the, um, the action on, on, a, on a finite uh, volume. Um, people often, in this context, people often like to um, is, in the space-time diagram, you're looking at some four volume V. And you may have looked at this. Um, is this the way you did it last week? I did it false. Sort of false. Oh, you did false. Oh, okay, good, good. Because there's really no need to do this. The way the book does it, you can just think of, look, I have um, x and t. I've integrated the Lagrangian density over all of space. And then the, um, the action obtained by integrating the Lagrangian with respect to t. Okay, now something I'd like to get clear in case, I don't know, David Jim went over this, but it's worth emphasizing that if you look at, say, if you look at classical mechanics, and you may have a Lagrangian that is a function of some corner q, and its time derivative and the action which is an integral of the Lagrangian with respect to time some initial to some final time so here we're going from some T1 to T2 and it obeys the Euler-Lagrange equation so if I set the action to be stationary I have the Euler-Lagrange equation. You may be used to seeing written like this. Um, equals dl by dq. And just what I'd like to emphasize to you is that this is exactly the same equation. Um, but this one, did you maybe go over this? Or? Yeah, the degrees of freedom. So just let, let me just maybe mention this because people, there's this tendency to think that the Lagrangian field theory is somehow something different. It is exactly the same. So if we look at this equation, let's write it as um, dl by d phi minus d by dt um, dl with respect to phi dot. by the x i l by the phi i is zero. So we can write this as follows um, or d by the t by dot is equal to the 
L by d phi minus d by d x i the L with respect to phi i. Now, it may not be immediately obvious, but these are actually exactly the same equations. And you might think, hang on, no they're not, there's this extra piece here. So what happens is, um, just to me, see, one of the things in this course I'd like to emphasize is that you're already, in, in principle, you already know all of this. There's nothing actually physically new in, in any of this. Um, so the point here is that if I um, if I take my field, um, let's say, let's just think of it in one space dimension. If I take my field on a lattice, if I discretize space, I just think about the value of the field, say the point xi, I've got a, a field phi i, that's the value of the field at the point x i. So I have a dis, so let's call this i is 1, 2, 3, 4, alright? Now what happens when I discretize my Lagrangian, um, the Lagrangian density is a function of the field of its time derivative and its space derivatives. Now, when I write this in a discrete form, it means that the Lagrangian is um, points or cells in three-dimensional space, so it's doing three dimensions, times a little volume element, times the Lagrangian density associated with the ith point, or the ith, the ith lattice site. So here I would have phi i, uh, phi i dot, And let's call it phi i primed. When you do a discrete approximation to the derivative, and maybe I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using i to denote the spatial, the index of the of, of the space component, and i to denote also the lattice site. Maybe we should use j here. Let's use J. Let's label the lattice sites with J. So when you discretize the spatial derivative, you're going to take this to be um, something like phi J plus 1 minus phi J over epsilon, where epsilon is a small distance. Now, what happens, so what that means is, so the gradient density is a function of phi, phi dot, and its spatial derivatives. This means that in the lattice approximation, each term in here depends on phi j, phi j dot, and phi at a neighboring point, where j prime is equal to j plus or minus 1. Okay, it will depend on the field at a neighboring point. So if you think about this, what this means is, that if I said, let's just apply the standard Euler-Lagrange equation to this system, okay, you can see how this term is just going to look like this. You get the same, up to this, apart from this volume element that's multiplying it. The dl by dq, if I calculate, if I calculate dl, by the phi i, so in other words, the analog of this, I'm taking 
derivative with respect to a coordinate. Okay? If I'm taking the derivative with respect to a certain field element, um, then what you find is, that, well, hang on, or let's say find j, you'll find that there is more than one term in here that contributes. Because there's a term uh, in phi j, okay, but then there are also terms in phi j plus or minus 1. Okay, so there's going to be another term in the sum where here you have, instead of j, you've got j minus 1, and here you'll have a phi j. There's more than one term. So if you calculate that derivative and take the continuum limit, you get this plus this term. You get all of this. So, I mean, if you're interested, you go through it. But the, I just want to emphasize to you that the Euler-Lagrange equation, this is always valid. What happens here? If I apply this equation, if I take Q to be my j um, field value at the j lattice site and evaluate this equation for this Lagrangian density, where, as I said, more than one term in here contains phi j. You take a continuum limit and you get this. All right, so, um, you know, so there's nothing different here fundamentally. It is all just, um, so in other words, classical Lagrangian field theory, so, sorry, Lagrangian field theory is just Lagrangian theory. Okay, just as quantum field theory is just quantum theory. Okay, there's no fundamental difference. All right, anyway, that may have just caused more confusion than illumination. I hope not, but anyway. Um, so classic, so Lagrangian field theory is just Lagrangian theory. So, um, you know how to um, All right, so we start off with the Lagrangian density. And this implies the Euler-Lagrange equations. I'm just going to write the null rank for one field. Um, so there's one equation for each field. Fine. Um, and the canonical momentum density canonical momentum density pi is defined to be the partial derivative of the Lagrangian density with respect to phi dot. Um, and we've already said that the, the okay, and then we have the Hamiltonian. is equal to an integral over space of the Hamiltonian density where the Hamiltonian density is equal to pi phi dot minus the Lagrangian density or more generally so if you have um, field, the book writes it like this, phi dot r minus the Lagrangian, where it's understood here that there is a sum over r, okay, the repeated indices are summed over, there's an implicit sum of, if I have more than one field, you take the uh, momentum density times the time derivative of the field, summed over the different fields, minus the Lagrangian, this gives you the Hamiltonian density. Um, so you should have seen the example of um, the 
following for the real fine Gordon field. And the gradient density is equal to a half. Um, I'm going to write it like this by alpha minus m squared phi squared, or if you like, you can write it as a half uh, g alpha beta, or let's say like this, g alpha beta phi alpha phi beta. And you should be able to work out that, the, that this implies the klein gordon equation um, by two dots sort of thing, what do you need to do is remember the, um, the Euler-Lagrange equation is the dl by d phi minus d by dx alpha, the Lagrangian density with respect to phi alpha is zero. This implies the Klein-Gordon equation. Um, Let's just check that we can work that out. Check that we know what we're talking about. So um, let's see. We need to work out d by l by d phi minus d by dt, the Lagrangian with respect to phi dot, minus d by dx i, the Lagrangian with respect to phi i, is zero. All right, what is this? dl by d phi. If I take the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to phi, I get minus m squared phi. Okay, we treat these. Uh, okay, what is, then I have minus d by dt. What is dl by d phi dot? dl by d phi dot. So this is equal to, um, so you can, if you want to write down the Lagrangian density in terms of its components. Here I have a phi dot squared. Um, and then I have a minus, whoops, I have a minus phi i squared minus m squared pi squared. So if we're just written, so alpha is zero, it's just the time, so this is, and remember the metric we're using is, we're using this convention here. So the, the time, time components are plus one and the space-based components are minus one. So an alpha is zero, when you have the index up or down, it's just a time derivative. The spatial parts, if I have the index up, I can lower it and include a minus sign. All right, so if I take the time partial derivative with respect to phi dot, I just get, um, I just get phi dot. So here we have phi dot, so we're working out the Euler-Lagrange equation here minus d by dx i. What is the partial derivative with respect to phi i? It is just um, minus phi phi comma i, and this should equal zero. So if I haven't made a mistake, this should reduce to the um, Euler-Lagrange equation. So I've, here I've got minus m squared phi, minus phi two dots, and then I've got plus. This is just, so we're summing over i, so this is just del squared phi is zero, and is that right? That is right, there we go. It's just the, um, it's just the Klein-Gordon equation. 
All right, so you knew all that already. Um, once you've got the, so the point is you have a Lagrangian density that gives you the Klein-Gordon equation. So then I can write down for this case, I can, so my canonical momentum density, which is just the partial derivative of Lagrangian density with respect to phi dot, is for this case, is just phi dot. So for the case of the Klein-Gordon field, the canonical momentum density is just phi dot. And so we can work out the Hamiltonian density is just pi, so pi phi dot minus the Lagrangian density. This is just phi dot times phi dot, so it's phi dot squared minus the Lagrangian density. The Lagrangian density is a half phi dot squared. Phi dot squared minus phi comma i squared minus m squared phi squared. So the Hamiltonian density, so writing this out, it is just, um, I can write it as a half. So a phi dot squared minus a half phi dot squared. So it's a half phi dot squared uh, plus um, this term we're summing over i. So this is just grad phi squared. So I can write this as grad phi squared plus m squared phi squared. But we want to write the Hamiltonian density in terms of the canonical momentum density pi, which is just phi dot. So I can replace phi dot by pi. So I have my expression for the Hamiltonian density. And the Hamiltonian, so this is the Hamiltonian of the Klein-Gordon field is just equal to the space integral of this. Okay, so there we are. So you know all about classical Lagrangian field theory. There are also the issue of the conservation laws, of which you've done, but which we'll talk about again a bit later. Let's now move on and quantize this. Before we look at quantization, I just ask, are there any questions about this um, classical Lagrangian field theory? Questions. You should all feel confident that if I give you an Lagrangian density, you can work out the field equations from the Lorentz Lagrange equations, you can work out the canonical momentum density, you can work out the Hamiltonian density, you can work out the Hamiltonian. It should all be a, tool, a toolbox that you can use. All right then. So let's now move on to quantum field theory. So, again, as I emphasized before, when you quantize this system, you are actually using the same rules as quantum mechanics. So, let's look at quantized. Range in field theory. Um, from the point of view of field theory on the lattice, so field element. call them phi i, which is just the value of the field at the point xi at time t. So here i is 1, 2, 3, well lattice points. I've, I've drawn it as if in, it's in one dimension, but really it's in three dimensions. Um, 
the standard canonical commutation relations. Sorry, you 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 promote um, so phi i becomes an operator. And the canonical momentum, let's write the canonical the momentum conjugate to this. So here we're looking at a discrete version of quantum field theory. The, the momentum conjugate to phi i becomes an operator, where the momentum conjugate to phi i is just the usual definition from standard Lagrangian field theory. Here we're looking at a discrete system. Imagine this is a system of particles with positions. Think of these as like positions of particles. You've got a set of discrete degrees of freedom. How do you quantize them? Well, you promote these degrees of freedom, these, uh, these configuration degrees of freedom and the momenta. You promote them to operators and you impose that they obey standard commutation relations. So phi, let's write phi i, phi i uh, p. Let's write it like this. Commutation is equal to put in an h bar, i h bar delta i i prime. What are we saying here? We're saying that if it's the same, if i and i prime are the same, so in other words, we're at the same lattice point, you know that x and p commute. So x and p obey this relation when, it's the, when the momentum is conjugate to x, then they don't commute. You have your standard commutation relation. This is just saying the same thing, whereas, of course, x, if you think about one particle, so CF, one particle, the x operator and the momentum operator for x don't commute. The commutator is IH bar. Um, the x, the position operator for x and the momentum operator for y commute, the commutator is zero. This is saying exactly the same thing. It's saying the field element here commutes with the momentum operator here, but the field element here does not commute with the momentum operator here. Okay, it's just the standard relations. Now, if you compare remember the canonical momentum density of the ith point is the partial derivative of the Lagrangian density uh, with respect to phi and dot at the ith point. So what does this tell you? It tells you that, that the momentum, that the canonical momentum is just the momentum density times our little volume element. Remember, really, we're dividing 3D space into a lattice where the there's a, you know, the, each lattice point is at the center of a volume, a small volume, delta P. Delta P is epsilon cubed. So epsilon is the spacing between the lattice points. Okay, so you've got a three. So we did this in the, in the, in the overview way back. So imagine, so let me maybe draw it a bit better. You've got a 3D lattice. Drawing it very well, but anyway, you can imagine a three-dimensional lattice of points that is that is um, separated in each direction x, y, z by epsilon. Anyway, so the point is here that well, if I want to write this in terms of my um, canonical momentum density, the canonical momentum is just the momentum density times my small delta v. So I can write this equation oops, if I divide by delta v. And then what we do 
is then we take the continuum limit. So um, epsilon goes to zero and our small volume goes to zero. And what happens in the continuum limit, delta i, i prime divided by delta v becomes the three-dimensional uh, Dirac, let's maybe write this, you could write it as xi, write it like this, it becomes a three-dimensional Dirac delta function. If you think about this, so um, obviously if these points are different, then this is just zero, it's just zero. If the points are the same, this is the connected delta, this becomes just one divided by delta b, which goes to infinity. If you think about integrating, I don't know if I have an example, um, if you think about, um, you might want to think about the following. It's just if you want to really convince yourself that these are equal, you might think about if I if I do an integral over space of delta three x minus x prime. Okay, and the claim is that this is so this is just the same as if I discretize space, this would be the same as the following. Let's If I imagine I, I, I take x and x prime and I now think of them as, as, as continuous, as a continuum limit of, of, a, of a lattice, then I would discretize my integral, I mean it's just writing an integral as a sum where delta v is going to zero, and the claim is that well this is the same as the Dirac delta function is really just delta i i prime. It's just the Kronecker delta divided by delta v. And you see that well indeed these delta v's cancel. This is just the sum over i prime of Kronecker deltas, which is indeed equal to one. All of these terms are zero except when i prime is equal to i. So this is equal to one as indeed it should be. If you want to do this a bit more carefully, you should say, well, actually, let's include a function in here, some function of x prime. Okay, so here I would have some function of x i prime. Here there would be the value of the function at the i lattice point. Is the value of the function at the i lattice point, and here would get the value of the function at the i sorry, the i prime lattice point, you get the value of the function of the i lattice point. In other words, it's the function of x i, which you should get, or the function of x. You can go through it if you want to convince yourself that in the continuum limit, this becomes uh, the Dirac, sorry, the three-dimensional Dirac delta function. So, what do we get in the um, continuum limit? So in other words, imposing the standard canonical computation relations, if we discretize our field, we, we, we divide space up into little elements, consider field element at each value, and we apply the standard commutation relations at each point here. We say at each point I've got a field element and a canonical momentum. I impose a standard commutation relation. You take the continuum limit, and what do you get? You get um, the following. You get the uh, canon. You get the what is often called the equal time, equal time commutation relation. look like this. So I have my field operator. Let's write it out now with uh, so th this, these are obviously all at some fixed time t. Okay, these are all at some fixed t. 
So these are really, remember they're in the Heisenberg picture. So these are operators at time t. We didn't include t, because it's just implicit. All of these operators depend on time. So let's put in the time dependence. And the position dependence, instead of the discrete index i is 1, 2, 3, we've just got the position, um, the continuously valued three-dimensional position in space. The commutator, so this is the field operator at time t at position x, its commutation relation with the canonical momentum density operator at position x prime from time t is equal to i h bar, we're putting in h bar just because you're, for familiarity's sake, but really we take it to equal 1. And here we have the three-dimensional um, Dirac delta function. So, And then, of course, the, you know that in this system, the commutator of phi with itself or of p with itself is zero. The analog of that in the continuum limit is just that phi hat xt commuting with the commutator with, with the field operator at a different point is zero, as is true for the um, Canonical momentum operator. All right, so here we have blah 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 blah. So normally these are the canonical commutation relations. for field theory now let me emphasize something that normally you would say alright let's take a field got its Lagrangian density we've calculated its canonical momentum density let's now quantize it what you would normally do you say alright we write down the canonical commutation relation you just write these down you don't go through all this rigmarole here you don't discretize it and impose this. The reason I've done it this way is just to emphasize to you that it is just standard quantum mechanics. You apply standard quantum mechanics to the field elements, take the continuum limit, is what you get. But once you've done that once, you've seen it once, that's it, never mind. Canonical commutation relations, it's just like the commutation relations you're used to, except instead of a Kronecker delta, you've got a Dirac delta function because it's a continuous field. But it is actually the same thing. Okay, now I'm going to say that for one last time. You must have said it about 50 times already. It is the same thing as standard quantum mechanics. All right, so here you are. You're doing your quantum field theory. You've got your Lagrangian density. You've calculated the canonical momentum density. Um, you've got your phi which becomes a field operator. You've got your moment, canonical momentum density, which becomes a field operator, and you impose these equal time canonical commutation relations. What happens if you have a whole set of fields? If I've got R, a whole lot of fields, lots of different fields, um, or it could, be, it could be one field with many components, say a vector field has three, three components. Um, each component becomes, um, each component becomes a field operator, each component has a canonical momentum density, becomes an operator, and what happens is that each of these, um, Let's be careful here. Let's use two different indices here. There's going to be, um, here you have to include a delta Rs. 
So if R is equal to S, if we're talking about the same field, then the field operator and its canonical momentum density the commutator is, is a Dirac delta function. But if they're two different fields, if R and S are different, if I'm talking about the field, if I'm talking about one field and the canonical momentum for a different field, then they commute. Okay, so this is zero. Um, here we've also got R and S, these all commute. So this is just the generalization to when I have um, lots of different field components. You, you impose a canonical commutation relations that look like this. Instead of the Kronecker delta, there's a Dirac delta function. Um, and, and there you go. So for the case, for the klein gordon field, Let's look at the Klein Gordon, the real, so the real Klein Gordon field. We've already seen that the canonical momentum density is just phi dot. So the canonical commutation relations for the Klein Gordon field look like this. So the CCR canonical commutation relations for the Klein-Gordon field look like this. I had um, xt phi hat dot x prime t. So this is the field operator at position x and t. This is the time derivative of the field operator at position x prime uh, and time t is equal to, we're going to put h bar in 1, so this is just i delta, this Dirac delta function, x minus x prime, and of course phi hat x t commutated with phi hat x prime t is equal to the commutator of, oh, sorry, um, phi hat dot dot t phi hat dot x prime t these are zero. Now, what we're going to do um, probably next week when we can go over the klein gordon field in detail, what we're going to do is and B, just to connect now with what we, what we were talking about before, we're going to write a field expansion a field expansion we're going to write and expand the field operator like this A and K E to the I K dot X minus omega T. So as we did for the electromagnetic field, here omega is the square root of mod K squared plus M squared. So if you expand the field in the usual form, the sum of plane waves moving backwards and forwards in, in different directions with respect to k, and you expand it, these are some unknown coefficients, some unknown operator coefficients, a and a dagger, the covariant, the, sorry, the canonical commutation relations imply, if you impose the condition that the field satisfies, these canonical commutation relations, you find that these coefficients, a and a dagger, obey the following commutation relations. K, K prime, 
etc. And of course, the A is commute and the A dagger is commute. And this is how you get the particle interpretation. Um, so think about the structure. I can write you down the logical structure of how quantum field theory works. Let's just write down the logical structure. Um, logical structure. Logical structure. So let's maybe call it um, one. Can you say one? You have a class. You have a classical field equation. You have a classical field equation, which it could be the Klein-Gordon field equation, could be electromagnetic. Where you have a classical field equation. Number two. Find the Lagrangian density. Whose Euler Lagrange equations imply that classical field equation. So this is logical structure of quantum field theory. Logical structure of quantum field theory. You start with a classical field equation. You find the Lagrangian density L that gives you that classical field equation via the Euler Lagrange equations. Three, you find the canonical momentum density pi. Find the canonical momentum density pi and the Hamiltonian h, which is an integral over the space of the Hamiltonian density. Four. So let's say that a classical field equation, maybe I should write it for, for, for fields, for fields by R. There you go. Um, and maybe there's more than one field equation. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. Find canonical momentum density pi R and the Hamiltonian density. Then what do you do? Once you've got the canonical, so this is all classical so far. This is all up to here. Everything is classical. Classical so far. All right, I'm just, what I've done, I've just rewritten classical field theory. I've taken a classical field equation, and I said, OK, I can think of this as coming from an action principle with this Lagrangian density associated with that as a canonical momentum density and this Hamiltonian. Okay, everything classical so far. Now, to quantize, you promote phi r pi r to operators. Operators pi and r obeying canonical Canonical commutation relations. So the canonical commutation relations are of the form phi hat r x t phi hat s x prime t is equal to i. So we put h bar is one. Delta R S delta three X minus X prime I'll put etc. Cetera. etc. Cetera just means 
Well, obviously, phi are they commute with themselves, the pi's commute among themselves, so the et cetera means, means the other bits that are obviously just zero. Um, and then what do you do? So the structure of quantum field theory is you then find You then expand the field operators by hat R XT in plane waves. So schematically by hat, let's just write if it's just one field, phi hat is a sum over, over modes, and I have this kind of form, e to the i, k dot x minus omega t, plus a hat dagger k, e to the minus i, k dot x minus omega t, here I've written for the case of a real field um, um, there's it's a it's a bit it's a bit a bit more let's say um, complex fields are a bit different. We'll we'll see what happens. When you have complex fields you'll find you have two types of the A and A dagger. You've got two types. There's an A and A dagger and there's a B and a B dagger. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that. But it's the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of thing. It's an expansion in terms of plane wave modes. And then what you do is then the uh, canonical commutation relations that you impose on the fields then imply um, the harmonic oscillator commutation relations for the A's and the A daggers, etc., which implies the um, energy levels, energy levels uh, equally spaced. equally spaced energy levels so SHO, simple harmonic oscillator energy levels for each K and then 7 you've got your expression for the Hamiltonian density which becomes an operator Remember classically you found an expression for the Hamiltonian in terms of the Hamiltonian density. This now becomes an operator. So for example, for the Klein Gordon field, this is an integral over all space of a half phi hat squared plus grad phi hat squared plus m squared phi hat squared. And when you work that out, when you write the fields in terms of the A's and the A daggers, you get this sort of thing. You get the sum over K of a half omega um, A hat dagger K A hat K plus a half. So, There we go. Which is the energy that so this is so here we have the energy operator. The energy operator for the field. And then of course there are other quantities which we will work with that come from the conservation laws, the momentum operator, um, also the spin operator that we're going to look at. 
and so on and so on, and I can calculate all of these observable quantities um, in, in, the, in this kind of form. So um, that is the now this structure uh, of let me down the road. Okay, that is the structure of quantum field theory. There's just maybe one could add a slight, let me maybe add number eight. Let me add number eight here. So Nerta's theorem, Nerta's theorem implies expressions for field momentum. Field momentum P, uh, the charge Q, and let's say the uh, the spin. Um, let's see what notation we can use. We can use um, So just as here, um, we found an expression for the Hamiltonian. There are also expressions for the charge, for the, uh, for the total field momentum, and for the spin. And these all become operators. These all become operators. There's an operator momentum, the operator for the charge, and the operator for the spin. And, um, and so on Thursday, we're going to look at these. We're going to look, for instance, at the chart at the complex klein gordon field, which I think you would have done last week. You would have done classically the charge, the classical charge. When you quantize that, you get a charge operator, <coughs> excuse me, a charge operator for the klein gordon field, um, and so on. So that is the logical structure. We are now, in a sense, at the top of the hill. You can see here, this is how quantum field theory works. Okay, now if you know if I give you some field equations, you should be able to go away and figure out, okay, let's find the Lagrangian that gives you this field. And from the Lagrangian, we can work out the cardinal momentum, we can work out the Hamiltonian. From Nerda's theorem, we can also work out expressions for the field momentum, the charge, the spin. Okay, so we've got all that, and that's all classical. Now we can promote all this to operators. We let these quantities become operators, and we impose that the operators obey the canonical commutation relations. These are the quantities too, the charge, etc. they all become operators. Once we've got the canonical commutation relations for the field and the canonical momenta, we expand the fields in terms of plane waves, and these coefficients are constrained. If you impose the canonical commutation relations on the fields phi and the canonical momentum density, you can obtain these relations, which then imply the equally spaced energy levels for each mode. I can then write the Hamiltonian in terms of these quantities, and you find I just get the total energy operator is just the sum of harmonic oscillators. Uh, it's the sum of harmonic oscillators. Um, and there's a, 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 um, each mode, as far as the energies are concerned, each mode is like a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, and then I can go on and also discuss other observables, a charge operator, and so on. That is quantum field theory. So the rest of this course, ah, so Thursday, I'm going to discuss um, the charge operator, the momentum operator, and then these kinds of things for the complex Klein Gordon field. And, um, and then the rest of the course, we're going to go through various fields, applying these rules. We're going to do the real klein gordon field, um, the complex klein gordon field, the Dirac field. We're going to redo the electromagnetic field, and then discuss interactions among these fields and different processes. So all the rest of the course is applying these rules uh, of quantum field theory. So um, are, are there any questions about um, questions about any of this. Questions? 
All right then. So thank you. See you. Um, please, the homeworks. Um, ah, uh, so sorry. Let me just say one little thing. Um, the homework. Homework two point two. Let me just say one little thing is important. Please, the homework. Um, homework two point two. Um, is very important in that what it asks you to do, it asks you to show, so for the Klein-Gordon field, it asks you to show you're given the Hamiltonian plus the canonical computation relations, and you have to derive the field equation. And the way you derive the field equation is you use the Heisenberg, the Heisenberg equation of motion. Now this is something like a consistency check. Remember we started with the classical Klein-Gordon field and then we quantize it. We should find that the quantized field operator also obeys the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay, that's the equation we started with. So you need to check that, given the Hamiltonian for the Klein-Gordon field and the, and the canonical commutation relations, you use the Heisenberg equation of motion, we're in the Heisenberg picture, you should be able to derive the Klein-Gordon equation for the field operator, so you show the whole thing is consistent. This is a very important exercise. If you can do exercise 2.2, then, then you know, you're sort of understanding the, the basic structure of quantum field theory. If you can't do exercise 2.2, it means you are completely lost in the dark wood and you don't know where you are and it means that you have to email me and ask for an office hour. Okay? Alright. Thank you.